On today's Locked On Thunder podcast, we're going to dive into the Oklahoma City Thunder making a massive trade. Not really. It's just shuffling pieces to get the roster cleaner. But what does that clean roster look like now and how important was that move with Houston to free up some money? Plus, Chet Holmgren speaks with us in the media yesterday for the first time since his injury. What did he have to say? And Mark talks about rotations, lineups, Poku, and Chet Holmgren. All this and more coming up on today's Locked on Thunder podcast on the Locked on Podcast Network, your teams every day. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. I am your host, media member, and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com. Ryland Styles. you can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOThunderPod. Email the show, LOThunderPod at gmail.com. On today's show, we're diving into the Oklahoma City Thunder making a trade. Chet Holmgren and Mark Dagnall talk to the media today. And the roster becomes even more clear with this trade that the Thunder made with the Houston Rockets after making a trade with Atlanta 24 hours before this one. So it's been a lot of trades, a lot of wheeling and dealing to get to the roster crunch that we uh, were looking at. But I want to talk first about Chet Holmgren. So today, uh, today after practice, the Thunder made Chet Holmgren available to the media for the first time since his injury. Uh, of course, it would have been way too difficult to have Chet Holmgren speak on media day because of just the obstacles of media day. We talked about it some yesterday about the setup of, you know, in the arena, it's like the content room and uh, wheeling through that on a scooter would not be fun for anyone. Uh, and then of course, just kind of going station to station would be very difficult on a scooter as well. So it was just best kind of not to force him to have to do that. So he talked to the media on Thursday and was very awesome. Answered all the questions that we had. Uh, some of the takeaways from Chet Holmgren speaking to the media. He talked about how, He's talked to Joel Embiid. He's talked to Joel Embiid's trainers as well about, you know, Joel Embiid's a guy that missed his first couple of years as a big man with a, a foot problem, right? So he, Joel Embiid's kind of been there uh, and done that while, you know, also, of course, turning into this superstar perennial MVP candidate that we've seen him turn into um, for his career. But, you know, he did not play in those first few seasons uh, because of a foot injury with Philadelphia. How did he get past that? What's the rehab like for him? You know, his trainers can give insight as well to that aspect. And Chet Holmgren talked about that, you know, Nick Collison is a resource as well, who is in the facility right now as training camp's kind of ramping up, of course. Um, he said that Nick Collison does not live here permanently in Oklahoma City, but uh, that he was able to see him this week uh, and, and talk to him. And Nick Collison, now, of course, different here to his shoulder, but still, he missed an entire season with an injury, his rookie season, what would have been his rookie season. Uh, and was able to still uh, come back and, and have a good NBA career. Now, was Nick Collison an all-star superstar? No, but he still had a really long and, and, and healthy and good NBA career where he got his n number retired and is the first Thunder player with his number retired up in the rafters. That's still a very good career for Nick Collison, so he was able to get past that injury mentally, physically, and was able to perform at the NBA level. I, I think whenever you look into the fact that He's rehabbing very well. He's using the resources available to him with connections to Joel Embiid and Joel Embiid's trainer and Nick Collison and I'm sure other players that have dealt with this injury he's reached out to as well. Um, you, you look at the mindset that he carries himself with and, and what players talk about. We talked about this yesterday. Every player on the roster yesterday, from 1 to 20, from 1 to 19, talked about how Chet Holmgren has the perfect mindset to attack this rehab, to come out better on the other side. He's got a long career ahead of him. Josh Giddy raved about Chet Holmgren in two different answers for his, for his mental ability to go attack this rebuild and come back better on the other side. Players talked about how he's still in high spirits right now. He's still wheeling around the facility, smiling, laughing, uh, supporting the players. And Chet Holmgren said that he's in the facility from about 8 to 2, and then he comes back at night to support the team on their second workout of the day uh, in the evening. So he's still living in the gym, even though he can't put any weight on that right foot right now. And he's scooting around 
And, you know, that could be discouraging. I mean, you were the second overall pick in the 2022 NBA draft. Um, and many people thought you were the best player in the NBA draft. And, you know, your whole life is basketball and you, and you want to be on the floor. You want to be showing what you can do, but you got hurt. Like, that could easily take a dark tor- turn in your psyche. And then for him to stay so positive, upbeat, supportive of his teammates and, and wanting to be around the game still is a big deal, especially this, you know, soon off of the injury. He also uh, just restated for everybody, and, and you can take this with you know with you in, in your battles for Chet Holmgren. He reaffirmed that he's never had a serious injury in his life. And, and I, I think that there's a bit of a perception versus reality thing here because even my boss, David Locke, yesterday we were recording our uh, season preview episode for Odyssey, which will come out pretty soon. Uh, but one thing that he said in there was that Chet Holmgren's very fragile. Again, does he look fragile? Right? Does he does he physically look fragile? Sure. He doesn't look like Joel Embiid. Doesn't look like a just a a God gifted Greek guy that Joel Embiid is, seven feet tall, two eighty. But just because he looks fragile doesn't mean that he is. He's never had an injury before until this point right here. This is his first major injury of his career. So it's not as though he had this fragile warning on him prior to this injury. And as I said, when the injury happened. Let's be honest. Nobody here is doctors. I'm not a doctor. You're not a doctor. You might be a doctor listening to this. I don't know. But still, you know, what determines if we call Chet Holmgren fragile or if we call Chet Holmgren injury prone will be if he gets hurt again. That's all it is. If he rehabs from this and never gets hurt again again in his career and never has to sit out another season, never has to sit out, you know, a chunk of a season, if he, if he goes the rest of his career and never gets hurt again to a major extent, then we'll never talk about this again. It'll be just a story that blows over in a year, and that's it. We'll never call him injury prone. We'll never call him fragile again, despite what he looks like, despite um, any of that. Now, if he goes and gets hurt again, then all of a sudden people will call him injury prone. That's all it is. It's nothing more or less. And and what's what's even more funny is we don't know, right? We don't know if one injury is tied to the next. So this whole narrative of you know of fragility and, and injury prone is kind of silly to, to make up because we just don't we just simply don't know if any of these injuries are connected or not and if they lead to each other or what and we don't know if Chet's ever going to get hurt again after this injury heals up uh, but he did reaffirm that that is this is the lone serious injury of his life he also talked about how uh, the Gonzaga products had a zag dinner at summer league and uh, a player he sat right next to was Demonte Sabonis and Sabonis. Uh, had nothing but great things to say about OKC. Of course, Sabonis, a fan favorite in OKC. That makes sense. Um, obviously, the Thunder make that trade 50 times out of 50 to go and get Paul George. But Sabonis, of course, showed flashes in OKC. People loved him. And uh, he's a really good player in Sacramento. Let's see where the rest of his career might take him. Maybe the all roads lead back to OKC. Who knows? It'd be nice if he came back to the Thunder. He's a all-star caliber of player. But it was nice to see Sabonis still having glowing things to say about OKC. And, uh, and how that kind of reputation still holds true of a lot of these former players, if not, you know, 99% of them all have very, very positive things to talk about, uh, when talking with the thunder and about the thunder and about the city and organization. So I, I think that with Chad Holmgren's press availability, it was everything you can imagine to, to make you feel more at ease, more comfortable, right? Whenever. Whenever you look at this injury, obviously it sucks that he's not going to get to play this year. Obviously it sucks that, you know, he will um, be out for the start of the season and for the entire season this year. But from everything we've heard from, from Sam Presti, from his fellow teammates, from Mark, everything that we've heard from him, it sounds more and more encouraging as the days go on that this is going to be a just bad luck, aw shucks type of thing. And then... Um, you get to watch Chet Holmgren become just a beast over over the next, uh, hopefully, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it may be for Chet Holmgren. Now, this show is brought to you by Bet Online, and so I want to tell you about our good friends over at BetOnline.net before we dive into what Mark had to say after practice. BetOnline.net is your number one source for football betting information this season. Find all the latest leads, news, developments, matchups, podcasts, and in-depth analysis of every game that you can find, plus MMA, boxing, golf, NBA, Basketball, all that fun stuff is there for today at betonline.net. And you might say, you know, I like football, I like baseball, but, you know, I really only feel comfortable wagering money on the NBA. 
That's perfectly fine. They already have NBA games out there for you to wager on. And it's not just games that you can wager on. You can wager on so much more than that. You can wager win totals. Will, um, you know, be able to, or how many wins you think that players, you know, teams will win and even who will make the playoffs. So for example, will the thunder make the playoffs? That is a no minus 5,000. The yes is plus uh, 1800. So if you feel comfortable with the thunder making the playoffs, you can go bet on that, but you can also bet on again, awards, um, win totals, and even opening night, the thunder are 11 and a half point underdogs on the road in Minnesota on opening night. If you think that that line is way too inflated, go over there, check it out at BetOnline, and make your bets at BetOnline.net. We are back on the Locked On Thunder Podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. I am your host, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunder Pod. Email the show, LO Thunder Pod at gmail.com. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Thunder your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you, talking Thunder basketball. For your next listen, check out Lockdown Fantasy Basketball. Josh Lloyd's going to help you win your league. So go listen to him and see what is what with Fantasy Basketball. He's the best in the business, folks. So Mark Dagon talked about. Uh, after practice, talked about Chet Holmgren, talked about how you know he's doing great attacking his rehab, but neither neither Mark nor Chet wanted to disclose what that rehab looks like right now for him, which is perfectly fine. Now, when asked who stands out at training camp, I want to focus on the players that Mark immediately talked about. Because to me, obviously, every coach is going to eventually get to every player, right? That's just the that's just the nature of coach speak. It's the nature of, you know, it's just the nature of the business. You're going to say X player jumps out, X player jumps out, and then eventually you're going to get to every single player on the roster. So I want to focus on the first two guys that that Mark said. The first two guys were Jeremiah Robinson Earl and Alexei Pokashevsky. He said that they both look like mature players and they both look different physically. We saw that in summer league with, with Jerry. Jerry looks incredible right now. Um, you know, I think that him, Trey Mann, Darius Baisley all had the biggest kind of body transformations over the summer. And then he went on to rave about Poku and said that Poku looks different physically with his lower body. He has more balance now. And what I thought was very interesting is that he said he has more awareness and, and he's more of a connector and more of a playmaker. Uh, Poku is more of a playmaker and a connector and a secondary playmaker. That's his biggest flaw, right? His biggest flaw has been his awareness and his ability to play within himself and to play within um, a system. And so if he's doing that now, that's obviously great. And I think that Mark made a really good analogy that we should all use for Poku. Now, does this analogy hold true for every single player in the NBA or on the Thunder roster? In my opinion, not really, but a player like Poku, it does. So Mark was basically trying to get everyone to, to kind of Wipe away these last two years for Poku and just focus on this year. And he said that, you know, if, if a if a spaceship came and dropped Poku in to this roster right now and to this lineup and to this basketball court, and you had no idea who he was, you had no idea about his past history, you'd say, wow, he's a really good player. But if you hold everything against him, you know, you might not get to that point because of your preconceived notions or because you just want to be right. You just want to be right about whatever your stance is right now on Poku. Now, with Poku, I agree with that. With Poku, I think that... That is the right attitude to have. I think that you should wipe away what you've seen the last two years. Just completely dis- dismiss it. Focus on this year. What is he this year? It's all been pointing to this year. It's all been leading to this year. And this year's a year for him to make a step. And I said that a year ago. I said that, you know, I don't think that this big leap will happen year one or two. I think that the big leap will happen year two to three. And it seems as though he's in line for that big leap if you listen to Mark and listen to the players or listen to Boku himself. But the reason I think that it works for Boku is because he shouldn't have been in the NBA two years ago. Like He shouldn't have been. He should have been in the NBA last year. He jumped from the second division in Greece all the way to the NBA. That is unfair. Now, if you're jumping from Kansas to the NBA, it's a little different, right? Kentucky to the NBA, it's a little different, right? So you don't want to forget and just wipe away totally those first couple of years. The way that you would give that grace period for Pokashevsky, who just flat out should not have been in the NBA. Was not an NBA player in the slightest but got valuable reps, and now 
uh, is working toward and is becoming right before our eyes an actual NBA player, it appears, uh, according to Mark. And we'll see him play in three days in the preseason and see how uh, how that is, how that goes. So I asked Mark about the fact that he has 16 active players right now instead of the full 20-man roster. And I asked him, you know, does that change anything? Like, does that change your workload or how much you can do um, at training camp? And he said, no, I actually like it better that we only have 16 guys. Uh, he said that, you know, it's just a simple math of the way that the rotate, that the uh, reps break down. You know, if you're going to play four and four or do anything, any work like that, it's just a lot smoother to get 16 in there versus 20. And uh, so he, he loved it. He, he loved the fact that they're kind of down and just made it seem like it's just an easier planning uh, to plan for 16 guys to get reps, 16 guys to go through drills, 16 guys on a, to scrimmage on those two courts. Like he mentioned, it's just, it's just easier. I wonder, is, is that foreshadowing to the Thunder's plan to leave a roster spot open this year? Probably not, but it is interesting that he said that, and then like two hours later, they make a tr- there you go, well, five hours later, they make a trade that could possibly leave them open a roster spot, which we're going to get to coming up. Uh, he also said that, there will be no loud starting lineup. So the lineup is going to be fluid. It's going to change as with the rotations. And so he cautioned everyone not to look into the preseason or even the start of the season in Minnesota. That is, they don't not going to have a starting lineup this year, pretty much. And he mentioned that the reason is because is, is mostly because of that five position. They have a lot of centers on roster that can all do different things. And so they can, they can play the matchup game with that five position. You know, if they need switchable guys, they have Jeremiah Robson Earl, Darius Baisley. If they need drop coverage, you know, they, they've got that on their roster as well. Like whatever they need, they have, and they can just keep mixing and matching depending on, um, you know, depending on whatever they, they're, they're mashed up with. I think that it's very interesting to see how they go about that. Obviously we're going to blow past that stop sign, right? We're going to, we're going to read into every bit of rotation minute logs that, uh, that we see from Mark in the preseason, but he's cautioning you not to do that. Now coming up, let's talk about the thunder, making a trade with the Houston Rockets, trading away Tam Allen and Derek favors plus Ty Jerome Mohawkless to the Houston Rockets. What does this mean? What should your reaction be to it? We are back on the Locked On Thunder Podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. I'm your host, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. Email the show, LO Thunderpod at gmail.com. On today's show, we're talking OKC Thunder and talking about the trade, which the Thunder are sending Derek Favors, Ty Jerome, Mo Harkless, Tail Malvon, and a 2025 second round pick via Atlanta to the Houston Rockets. Houston is sending David Nwaba, Sterling Brown, Trey uh, Burke, and Marquis Chris. So the reason that the Thunder were allowed to trade Mo Harkless with other players, even though they just traded for him 24 hours ago, was because they absorbed him into the Chet Holmgren disabled player exception. Uh, the Thunder, if you didn't know, traded David Critchie for Mo Harkless plus a second round pick. They parlayed Mo Harkless and that second round pick to get a clean roster and to get out of favors of steel. So that's all that happened here. They turned it. Vit into Har- uh, Harkless in a second round pick. They turn Harkless in that second round pick with Jerome Favors and Malvon into a clean roster uh, and some some cap flexibility and getting further away from the tax line. That was the biggest thing. They now have comfortable breathing room from that tax line, and that's what you need whenever you're a tanking team. There's no reason to even be pushing close to that luxury tax line if you're going to lose the majority of your games for Houston. They only take back an extra million dollars in all of this um, funny business, and they gain a second round pick. So they basically bought a second round pick for a million dollars. They also got cash considerations, which uh, Jackson Gatlin of Lockdown Rockets was the first to report. For the Thunder, they were going to have to cut three of the four guys anyway, just to be within the, the mandate of the uh, NBA guidelines by October 17th. Houston is already deciding to cut Ty Jerome per the athletic. They will uh, use the preseason to figure out how they want to handle the rest of the guys that they got back. Houston will. If you go back and remember in 2020, when the Thunder um, got Admiral Schofield and a second round pick, which was Vidkrichi, from uh, the Wizards, they made the Wizards' life easier by taking on a guy who, in, in Schofield, had more guaranteed money. They could comfortably waive him, plus they gained a second round pick. This is, that's all this is. That that move was for a second round pick and to get a clean cut for Washington. 
That's all it says, only in reverse, where Houston gets a second round pick and OKC gets the cleaner cuts um, in all of this and the salary relief and all of this. So what does the roster look like right now? As it stands today, and we don't know if or when these Houston guys will report, but as it stands today, the Thunder have Shea, Josh Giddy, Lou Dort, Jalen Williams of Santa Clara, Trey Mann, Trey Burke, Sterling Brown, David Nwaba, Usman Jang, Alexei Pukashevsky, Darius Baisley, Jeremiah Robinson Earl, Aaron Wiggins, Kenneth Williams, Chet Holmgren, Jalen Williams of Arkansas, Mike Muscala, Marquise Chris, and then the two ways, Lindy Water and Eugene O'Moruri. So what's going to happen now after all of this? Well, the Thunder are going to cut these Rockets guys, which again are Chris, Nuaba, Brown, and Burke. If anyone from Houston survives the cutdown day, I think it'll be Nuaba or Chris. If they, you know, they, they, they physically have to waive, they forcibly have to waive three of the four. They have to, to get within the NBA guidelines of a 17-player roster uh, on October 17th. So by October 17th, at least three of these four guys are gone between Chris, Nuaba, Brown, and Burke. If anyone survives again, it's going to be Nuaba or Chris. If they waive all four, then the Thunder will then go from a roster crunch to an open roster spot. Now, typically, when the Thunder were contending and competing, oftentimes they had an open roster spot available, especially at this point in the season in October. They had an open roster spot, and they carried it that way through March, through the buyout deadline, through all that fun stuff. So the Thunder are no strangers to playing, quote-unquote, a man down, so to say. If they were to do that, of course, that opens the door to, to converting Lindy Waters the third into a standard NBA contract versus a two-way deal. Then that opens up a two-way deal for the Thunder to use and, and bring another flyer in on that two-way pat. So there's a lot that the Thunder can do here. There's a lot of different avenues to go if you're OKC. We'll see what they elect to do, but it's pretty cut and dry now. This is your roster. doesn't matter if you keep Nuaba or Chris or whoever you keep, right? You can only keep one of them. This is your roster, and that's what you're going to go into the season with. Uh, and when you get healthy, this team will be very, very, very fun. So, again, preseason is in three days, and i got a very special announcement. So, Locked on Thunder, we're five days a week, Monday through Friday, plus after every single game. But, leading up to the Minnesota game, every day, every day, leading up to the season opener, we will have a podcast every single day, getting you ready for the start of the season. So, subscribe for free across all podcasting platforms, including on YouTube, and until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.